Will you look this good when you turn 100? Happy birthday to our national parks. Welcome to Vacation Mavens, a family travel podcast with ideas for your next vacation and tips to get you out the door. Here are your hosts, Kim from Stuffed Suitcase and Tamara from We Three Travel. Hey Kim, welcome back. You were down in Florida and where? South Carolina recently? Yeah, South Carolina. So what were you doing down there? I had a conference for a traveling mom as kind of like a writer retreat because I do write for them. And so I was down there meeting some of the other writers and doing some fun stuff. And when I was not at the conference, I spent an extra day, went into Epcot and partook of the Food and Wine Festival, which Tamara, I think this is something you actually need to look into to get you back on Disney property. So I was pretty impressed. It, I I do think it's kind of an expensive thing. I wish the food was included with your park admission or if they could figure out a way to somehow separate them because you do have to pay for a park ticket. And then once you pay for a park ticket into Epcot, then you're able to go walk around the World Showcase, which is where they have all the countries, not all the countries, but they have a lot of countries represented. And for the Food and Wine Festival, they each have specialty foods and drinks on offer. So are they, is it kind of like a food festival where they're set up in tents and things, or is it just going into the regular restaurants that would be there? No, it's, there are separate tents. They're like little, okay. um, but they're, they're nice tents. <laughs> it's, it's Disney tents, right? I mean, they're almost like little shops, pop-up mm-hmm. shops kind of. Sure. Um, and yeah, so each, each country that's participating, they have like three foods on offer and normally, you know, three drinks on offer and it. It's really cool. And the food, I was surprised because they do it in a way where you kind of wait in line, you step up and you place your order and then you take your receipt and walk around to a window and you show your receipt and they hand you the food. And the food is already like pre-proportioned and ready. So it's really fast, but I was really worried about the quality and I ate at three different places. So I ate at the Mexican restaurant, the Japanese and the Greek, and all three of them were absolutely delicious. And I even had shrimp at Japan and they, um, it was, it tasted great. So, so is it, um, like you pay depending on what you order or is it just you? Okay. So like the shrimp could be a different cost than whatever yeah. else was there. Yeah, okay. like the shrimp was 650 and the edamame was 450. Okay. And the chicken, you know, Slovakia was 450 or whatever. It just varies. Everything varies right around um I would say from the $4 to the $10 mark depending on what you're getting. Like Mexico seemed to be probably the most expensive and like their drinks were quite pricey. Their drinks ranged from I believe 7 to $10. Uh, for the three that they had on offer, but so were they regular like meal size and regular drink size portions? No, then? <laughs> oh. no, yeah. So they're like so, small, like because I think of a food festival, I think about going up and getting like little tastes from different things, like something that I can eat standing up. Yeah, yeah. They're served okay. in those like kind of those boats, those paper boats. Mm-hmm. You know mm-hmm. those ones. So they fit kind of about your hand. They're probably about your palm size. So, I mean, they're not just tasters. They're a little more than tasters, but they're definitely not a full meal, if that makes so sense. So that could be, yeah, no, it is. So it gets that expensive really fast. Yeah, yeah, it gets expensive fast. But I figure if you're going to splurge, I really liked the atmosphere. I thought the food was really cool. So I recommend it, but definitely know that it's pricey. Yeah. Anyway, so, so we did that. And then I also, one of my big things I did was I went to uh, Mickey's Not So Scary Halloween Party. And of course, I was by myself, so sans kids, and I went with some girlfriends. And I ended up writing two posts about that trip because um, I had some great tips that I felt needed to be shared if you were going to go. So if you're going, um, we'll link to the my post in the show notes. But there's some definite tips on like where to sit and how to manage your time to get the most out of it. Because again, that's an additional ticket that you need to buy. Um, oh, it is. Yes. So it's a ticket you buy. It's not included with your park admission. But the one thing about it is it does get you into the parks early. So I recommend, you know, just taking that day, the morning and doing like a pool day or doing something else. And then your ticket gets you in at 4 p.m., even though the party starts at 7. So then from 4 to 7, you can kind of do a few of the rides and 
play. No, I always just assumed that that was what they called when they decorated it for Halloween. Like I didn't realize that there was like a special separate event then. So is that, is that event really more about kind of trick or treating or what is, what happens at the not so scary Halloween party? So it features a few different things. It has trick or treating. Yes. They have candy trails. They have special character meet and greets. So like Jack Skellington and Sally, and they have, you know, the fab five dressed up in Halloween costumes. So like Minnie is dressed up as a witch and Donald and Daisy are dressed up. And so it's okay. Are those the fab five? Yeah. Fab five, okay. like Mickey, Minnie, <laughs> Donald, Daisy and Pluto. I might get that wrong and a Disney fanatic is going to hate me, but yeah, <laughs> those are the, the original, like Mickey, Minnie, Donald, Daisy, Pluto. I'm pretty sure. Uh, it might be goofy. I don't know. Anyways, Leslie, give us a call and let us know. <laughs> yes. All of our Disney fans tell me what I'm doing wrong. Um, so no, but they dress up in special Halloween costumes. So there's, there's an added little extra meet and greet. Plus there's got villains, it. you know, you've got, you can go meet some of the famous villains like Cruella or Jafar or whatever. Okay. Um, But the other big thing is they have special entertainment. So they have a special parade that's just done for the party. They have special fireworks that's just done for the party. And then they have a stage show that again is just for the party. So yeah, those are the big, the big draws. And And you had some good news about the, um, about the trick or treating part of it, right? I was so impressed, you know, I have to say that Disney is one of those companies that every once in a while they they do something. And I'm just like, man, they actually get families. They understand and they care. They don't just care about the bottom line. They have an allergy friendly option now for families who have food allergies. And they actually have really thought it out. It's not just like, oh, we have apples here next to the candy that you can grab. No, they've really thought out how the process works. And so when you trick or treat, if you have a food allergy, you get a special teal because teal is the color of food allergies. And um, they have a special teal bag that you can go trick or treating. And at the candy stops, instead of getting candy out of the bucket, they give you a token that goes in this bag. And then the kids, the families with allergies take it those bags of tokens to one of two redemption stations. And in those redemption stations, they have, you know, a separate set of allergy free foods and even non food treats. So that's nice. It's really, I was so impressed. They did. It's a really well done. So good job, Disney. Yeah. Very happy with them. So anyways, but then, (laughs) and then I went and drove some Mazdas around South Carolina, the low country, which I had never been to before. And I saw an alligator like right off the bike path while we were biking. And I uh, stepped into a, um, a mound of fire ants evidently <gasps> and got bit. So, uh, so this specific Northwest girl was quite, <laughs> quite overcome, but it, the low country is beautiful. So, but definitely a and learning, learning. You were staying. It's funny because the week before I was sitting in on a webinar and I heard about this montage uh, resort and I posted, Oh, I really want to go there. And then you said, how did you know that that's where I'm going? So yes. what did you think of that resort? It's gorgeous. It, it makes you want to like, it feels like you're living in the notebook, you know, that movie, mm-hmm. the notebook, mm-hmm. that's what it feels like. And, um, so I stayed at the inn and it's very, you know, grand, but Southern and kind of, it's, it's out in nowhere. So it's, it takes you a while to get there, but it's just on this big land of property, which is Palmetto bluff. And there's people who have private residences and everything there. Um, and it's really a gorgeous area. So it's, it's a beautiful piece of property. And the room was absolutely wonderful. I, they have a variety of rooms. Some people were put in like guest houses. I stayed in a room in the inn and so it's gorgeous. Nice. So I'll keep it on my list then. Yeah, I would say so. I I didn't get to experience the spa. I it's definitely a high end place. Really right. high end, I guess. Um so just yeah, being aware of that, it's definitely high end. They have a great little bar there, but I would say that the room service, I was a little I feel like their their dining needs to step up a little more to handle the guests if they're gonna be sold out. So mm. um that's one thing to be aware of. That, um, but I guess they've got, I didn't even know they didn't have it listed because I literally was there for one, like two nights to fly in and out. And so one day of activities and there's, you can walk all around and on property, they have a great little 
restaurant that I heard was the best place to go. So I wish I kind of would have gone to that. Yeah, I think if I went down there, I would definitely want to do um, to have some good food because I think, you know, the low country boil and some seafood and southern mix, like it just seems like such a, a great foodie destination. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Check that out. Yeah, so it was a lot of fun. And we went to one place, you know, we kayaked down and I got to see dolphins in the water. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, so that was kind of cool. And do you have any biscuits and gravy? That evidently they had that there. They didn't have that on the room service menu. So. Did you ever did I ever tell you the story about when Hannah and I went down to Virginia last year? No. So our first day we went to um we were so we were in like around the Virginia Beach area. We we're in um Newport News. And she went up to a breakfast buffet and I wasn't that hungry. So I was just up at the counter ordering a smoothie and she came back, she's eating. And all of a sudden, like her eyes kind of popped up and she was like, this is really weird tasting oatmeal. And I looked at it and I'm like, were there like biscuits near where you got that? And she was <laughs> like, yeah. So she had basically, she had taken some oatmeal and then she thought it was like another kind of oatmeal. She put it on top. She had taken a whole bunch of the white sausage gravy and put it on her oatmeal. And so, yeah, her face was kind of priceless. She was just like, wow. She's like, I'm trying to enjoy this experience, but yeah, <laughs> that's funny. So I'm like, yeah, that's, that's gravy. Yeah. So that's always our, I'm like, yeah, Northern girl meets Southern food for the first time. Yeah. Well, I didn't have grits either. And I was like, I, I kind of wished I would have gotten, I wish I would have just been able to explore more. So, cause it would have been fun to kind of go to that restaurant and try some. Yeah. Cause well, I've whole never area, tried like, grits. Like Savannah. Oh really? Yeah. I've never. Yeah. You'll have to go. Uh, yeah. To go back to the South. But also I had really, really good uh, like shrimp and grits when I was in Gulf Shores, Orange Beach, Alabama. I yeah. love the food down there. Yeah. But I, that whole area, like Savannah, Charleston, like all that area is somewhere that I really, really want to get to. And it's really not that far. So it's surprising that I haven't made it there yet. But yeah, you should die on my go. list. Yeah. Yeah. It's just be careful when you step in the grass, look for dirt mounds because evidently there's fire ants. Okay. <laughs> and beware <laughs> of water. Well, I guess, I guess there's um, lots of things to beware of in national parks, too. That's true. Wildlife is everywhere. So national parks, definitely. We appreciate the wildlife in national parks. And I'm excited to hear hear more about them since it's they're turning 100. Yeah. Or they turned we, 100. Yeah. We got to see some very excited wildlife the last time we were there with grizzly bears and elk and black bear. And so, yeah. And buffalo. Buffalo, yes. Or Buffaloofas, as Hannah has caused them. Yeah. Very cool. Well, let's talk to Ford all about our national parks. Great. Okay, so today we are here with Ford Cochran, and he is from National Geographic, and he is a geologist, journalist, and educator, and the director of programming for National Geographic Expeditions. And Ford is responsible for selecting the expert scholars, writers, photographers, explorers, and staff that the society sends along on its educational expeditions around the world. And I believe you're also a dad. I'm also a dad. Good. So welcome. I'm glad that you could join us today. Thrilled to be with you today. Great. So before we get started talking all about our national parks, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Like, where do you live? How many kids do you have? That sort of thing. Sure, absolutely. Well, I, I live in Northern Virginia, which is where I grew up, not far from uh, National Geographic headquarters in downtown D.C. And uh, so suburban, suburban Virginia. And I am a father of two boys, Cole, who is age 16 and a uh, new junior in high school, and Ryan, who just began high school. He is 14 years old. Nice. So I imagine you've had lots of adventures with them. Lots the and lots. Lots and lots of adventures with them, uh, and and I love taking them to uh, my wife and I love taking them to the national parks and sharing them with them. We've been doing so since they were uh, they were quite young. Well, I know I you kind of came across our radar earlier this year with some of the new books that National Geographic just published, and then we actually used some of those books um, when we were planning our trip. We we just came back from both the Grand Tetons and Yellowstone. And it was really fun as we were driving through the parks. You know, you know how it is with national parks. You have a lot of driving time. So the girls were in the back doing the national park funny fill-in, which is kind of like the Mad Libs type of uh, activity. 
And then in some of the downtime, they were doing the Junior Ranger activity book, too. And we were using the guide to the national parks before we left. So we, we had a lot of experience, and it was really a lot of fun. But I was wondering if you could tell the listeners a little bit more about some of the new books that you guys just came out with. Well, absolutely, sure. And and so exciting that you got to Yellowstone and the Tetons this summer um, during the centennial of the National Park Service. Uh, that great parks, two of my very, very favorite parks. We wanted to make sure that families had, had what they needed so that their kids could get really excited about the parks and very much uh, informed about them as well. Kids, of course, are uh, you're a parent, so you know that uh, you know um, when we're making choices about where to go with our precious vacation time and dollars, we want to go to places that the kids are going to enjoy and, and that they're, they're going to be memorable. And, and the more excited the kids are about the places, the more likely it is that you'll get there and that they'll enjoy them when they get there. And so, so we wanted to create things like the Kids Guide so the kids could see that the national parks are, are absolutely some of the most amazing places in our country and on earth, for that matter, and, uh, and really be able to appreciate them and, and be excited about the wildlife they'd see, the landscapes they'd encounter, some of the history of the parks when they go. Um, and part of that, you know, part of that is for the enjoyment of families, the enrichment of families. Part of it as well is that the geographic, we, we've been big fans of the parks and the park service since, in fact, before we had a national park service, well over a century. Uh, we have been uh, enthusiasts for the national park idea. And so we know that the parks and other public lands are really, they're, they're only as safe, they're only as conserved as preserved as every generation chooses to make them. And so some of the most important advocates for our national parks are uh, our country's kids today. We want to be sure they grow up loving the parks just like we do. That's such an important part. I, I absolutely see that. And it's neat to see that, you know, a company understands that our future generation and the, you know, the care of our planet comes down to what we're teaching our kids today. So that's great. And yep, I like and- Go ahead. Go I ahead. like that the books also were very digestible. So the like the kids, you know, guide to the parks. Like you have, you know, you have a way to just kind of flip through and get a sense of what's there. And you know, there's pictures. I like to involve kids in the planning process and really helping decide where we're going to go and what we're going to do. So I thought that was perfect. Yeah, we wanted to be sure there were lots of ideas for exciting things you might be able to see. You know, again, the wildlife that you can see if you go to the right places in the parks at the right times. And uh, some of the cool trails, some of the nifty features of the parks that you can make a priority on your, your itinerary day by day. And uh, so we tried to load the book up, the books up with that and with, uh, and with memorable uh, information, just really great nuggets of information about the parks that, uh, that the kids would, uh, would definitely remember and want to share. So you were just on a a trip visiting a lot of different parks, right? That's correct. Yes, so national I, the, our our ultimate national parks uh, expedition we called it for the for the centennial year. That sounds fun. So I imagine that with all of the different parks that you've seen, you must have some favorites. Do you have I like have, a top five? I have. Well, I have a lot of favorites, and I and I actually thought long and hard about which I'd recommend to families. As a top five, I mean, I think every one of the national parks has something to re- recommend it. And as a quick aside, so people know, when you think about the Park Service, there are the, the, the big parks designated by Congress, signed into park status by the president, and there are 59 of those in our country. But the National Park Service actually administers more than 400 parks, seashores and lakeshores, historical sites, national trails, national recreation areas, lots of national monuments, which the president can create all by him or herself. And, uh, and so our country has many of those too. But thinking just right now about the, the 59 parks, um, some that are, that are absolutely tremendous for families. Uh, I, think, I think one is the first national park in the world, uh, Yellowstone National Park. And that has a little bit of everything and actually a lot of everything. And so that's a place that's great to share with your family. It's one of the first parks I took my oldest son to, Cole, when he was seven years old. Uh, we went out to Yellowstone and, and Grand Teton National Park right next door. I mean, it's got hot springs and geysers and steam vents. It's got wildlife. It's been called America's Serengeti because there is so much extraordinary migrating wildlife in, in that national park. And it's got tremendous history. And so as you travel around the park, I mean, you could spend a day there. It'd be a very, very busy day trying to see a lot of it. You could spend, you know, weeks, months. Some people have spent lifetimes in, in Yellowstone and never get tired of the place. There's so much to fascinate kids. It's a place where not just the wildlife, but the geology is really lively, is really alive. So Yellowstone, I think, should be on every family's bucket list. 
Um, another of the big, you know, uh, renowned parks that I think every family should get to is the Grand Canyon. And uh, I was just at, at, on that trip. I was just at both of these parks. We finished up in the Grand Canyon. I was lucky enough to actually be there on the, the centennial day of uh, August 25th of the creation of the U.S. National Park Service. And they baked a big birthday cake uh, for the Park Service. And I got to have a slice of that. <laughs> That's so the, the Grand Canyon is a place that, you know, it's we at National Geographic, right? We're about visual storytelling. We're about photographs and, and you know, film. Film, video, um, and and telling stories visually with, um, you know, the, the tremendous talent of our photographers. And yet, I will tell you, there there are magnificent photos of the canyon, including in uh, last month's issue of uh, of National Geographic magazine, or actually this month, the the September issue. We have a story about it um, that's full of great photos. Nothing, nothing replaces the experience. Can substitute for the experience of being there. So if you've if you've been there, you know. If you haven't been there, when you go and you first set eyes on it. It will blow you away. And it does that for grown-ups, um, but it does that for kids too. I, I was lucky to get there with uh, neighbors who took me, though I lived back east, they took me on a Winnebago trip out west when I was maybe six or seven years old, very, very young, and uh, with their family. And uh, I still remember being that young. I have very few memories from that age, except mostly th- that trip. There's, again, a lot of everything for uh, families and kids to enjoy in the Grand Canyon. So get your kids there if you can. Now, another one, um, for uh, particularly for my friends back east, and there are many of us, Great Smoky Mountains National Park. That's actually the most visited national park. And it's, uh, it's accessible. It's a place that, you know, conveniently, uh, again, for those of us who live on the east coast, we can drive there. If you live out west, there's so many places you can get to. Here in the east, we have some national parks. We have Shenandoah. We have uh, in here in Virginia near D.C. We have Acadia up in Maine. We have the Everglades and Biscayne and, uh, you know, uh, other parks down in Florida. But um, the Great Smoky Mountains is just a, a big, beautiful park. Um, the, 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 the biggest chunk of preserved uh, Appalachia, the Appalachian Mountains, big portion of the range. So, so you can really go on it. You can go on a short day hike, a few hour hike, or just a wonderful drive to different places, uh, scenic vistas through the park, uh, take in some history of the mountains and the people who lived there before it became a national park. And, uh, and then if you want to, you can, you can really get up into those mountains on trails. Again, if you plan ahead, I love the National Park Lodges. There's one in, in Great Smoky Mountains. It's called the LeConte Lodge. And the only way to it is to hike to it. They use llamas to bring in food and, and the other supplies that they need on the top of Mount LeConte. But uh, if you go with your family, you're going to hike up to the top of that mountain, and uh, and you, uh, suddenly you're in another world up up above uh, Gatlinburg, a little town right within the margins of the park. It's kind of surrounded by it, like the the hole of a donut, and uh, and and then beautiful mountains, beautiful vistas in every direction from there. Lots of trails to hike, and you can just have a wonderful getaway where you feel like you've traveled to another another world. Another favorite park of mine uh, for families is is Glacier Bay. Uh, and I was thinking, you know, there are eight national parks in Alaska, and there's so much wildness, so much wild land in Alaska. There are still glaciers up there, um, and I get out uh, every year. I go to uh, to Iceland, and uh, so I see glaciers there. I go with uh, high school students to Iceland. Uh, I've been doing that for for about a decade now, and and glaciers everywhere around the world are in retreat. Climate's changing; it's getting warmer. Um, you can still see huge, magnificent glaciers up in Alaska, and and this as a landscape that's sort of disappeared appearing fast. It's one of those places as parents. It's great to take your kids so they can see them and walk on them, experience them. And you can, you can when you get into Glacier Bay, um, you know, you can take a small boat in the geographic has a ship that goes there, but you can also um, get there on your own, uh, sort of fly in and, and book, a, book a day trip on a, on a boat into Glacier Bay. And you're going you're gonna to see these wonderful glaciers, some of them calving directly uh, into the bay. You're also going to see a lot of marine life. Um, really extraordinary creatures. You're going to see seals. And you might see humpback whales, depending on the time of year that you go, uh, and, uh, and, and um, killer whales. I mean, all sorts of, uh, of incredible marine life. And then on land, you could take hikes uh, at Glacier Bay, and um, they have both uh, you know, brown bears and black bears. Brown bears being grizzly bears. So there's an opportunity. You don't want to get too close, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but you, may have a, you may have a chance to see you know, these incredible iconic species. So fascinating for kids, lots to see up there, and then a whole world to explore if you can even get beyond it. Many other national parks to go and explore. Finally, and you can have a great experience in so many of the parks, but I think for variety, uh, if you've got kids, one of the wonderful things I've done with my family uh, that my kids just loved was a trip to Mammoth Cave in Kentucky. And we have several uh, cave-focused national parks, Carlsbad, 
absolutely gorgeous and uh, in, uh, in New Mexico. And up in the Dakotas, you can get to Wind Cave national park and one of the things that they they offer is like a wild cave tour so you can take a sort of a you know a historic cave tour and go see beautiful parts of the cave uh guided by rangers they have lots of different trips but if you really want to experience spelunking and see what this uh extraordinary and strange part of our world looks like that so few people get to see you know you can put on uh, knee pads and coveralls and a headlamp and a hard hat and uh get right into sort of uh the deep dark primitive parts of the cave you know, turn off those headlights and be immersed in total darkness, you know, crawl through tight crawlways and all of that. And, and like I said, I did that with my boys and they absolutely positively loved it. Yeah, my daughter would love that. We did something similar in a lava tube cave out in Oregon a couple years ago. And it's a little freaky when you turn off the headlamps. But at the same time, like having a chance to be down in the earth with only a couple people, it's, it's pretty cool. It's it's pretty it's really really quite remarkable and you and you sort of think about you know you you the, you know I mean what you hear what you see the whole concept of you know sort of color and distance and and all of it you know everything is different it's a different world down there it's fun to go in and then when you come outside the sunshine if it's a sunny day is so bright and the air feels so warm um, it feels like you've stepped back into another world so it helps you appreciate you know what we uh, maybe take for granted a little bit in our day to day lives better too now. Can I add? Can I add one more park to my yeah. uh, to my list? That was five. I'm thinking about all the great adventures I've had with my kids, and one that was a real favorite. Now, if you have very young kids, you can you can do this park with young kids, and you can do it with older kids too. Zion National Park. So Zion is 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 a place like you know if you've seen pictures of Yosemite Valley, another great national park for everyone, but but particularly with kids. You've seen Yosemite. You have these soaring walls of granite. Big, big cliffs. Well, in Zion National Park, you have another deep, narrow canyon like like uh, Yosemite Valley, but the walls are red sandstone. So you have these huge, steep red sandstone cliffs towering above the valley. At one end of it, the Valley of the Virgin River and in Utah. And, and at one end, you can walk upstream in that river for miles if you want to on a trail called the Narrows. Uh, and, and what they do is, is you know, there are outfitters right at the entrance to the park that will rent you big walking sticks and water shoes if you don't have water shoes uh, that are designed to uh, keep the rocks out. And uh, but allow you to walk pretty easily in the water, and you walk right in the stream, you know, on the cobbles in the stream, and it's this fantastic experience. You're in this narrow little slot canyon with the walls rising, you know, hundreds and and ultimately thousands of uh, of feet above you, and you're you know you're just having this really wonderful exploration in this extraordinary place. It's a great place to get photos as well. Now, if your kids are a little more uh, more intrepid, energetic, and you are too, you can hike from the valley floor right up fifteen hundred plus feet to uh, places. Well, the rim of the canyon is a little more than 2,000 feet above the floor of the valley. There's a place called Angel's Landing that I went to with my son. So my wife said, you all have fun. She hiked up as far as the sort of the jumping off point for it. So she did the the vertical piece, but uh, you cross a narrow part of a fin holding onto a chain, and then you get out onto this, uh, this place in the center of the valley. You're completely surrounded by it. The river actually makes a meander right around the fin called Angel's Landing. And then you have this panoramic view in every direction. It was just such an incredible accomplishment. My kids felt great about it. I had told them I wanted them to be very, very careful. Um, you, you know, you've got to be careful because it's a, it's, a, it's a trail where you wouldn't want them to fall. So you want your kids to be a little bit older and a little bit surer on their feet like billy goats. But once you get out there, the reward is tremendous. Yeah, it sounds amazing. I, I know it'd be one that my husband would also say, have fun, but yeah. <laughs> it sounds like a tough one, though. Yeah, not for the, not for the acrophobic, but, uh, yeah. but, but it's good. And it's a good workout. You feel, you feel so great when you get to the top. I'll mention, we talked about the Grand Canyon. There's something to think about when you go with your family. Always uh, talk to the rangers if you're going to go below the rim. The canyon has you know, the issue of being what uh, some refer to as an upside-down mountain, which is to say, typically, if you're going to climb a mountain, you know how far to go up because when you're winded and you just basically don't have any more energy to go up, you turn around and start going down and that's easier. In the canyon, you have to do the hard work on the way out. And so uh, it's easy for folks to go charging down a trail thinking, oh, this is a piece of cake. And then they turn around and all of a sudden, you know, they've got 2,000 vertical feet to climb on the way out. It sounds amazing. So like you did, did you, you connected quite a few, it sounds like this summer. So do you recommend that families plan like a national park trip where they're connected or just go to one? 
I think, you know, it depends on what you and your family like to do, what your style is. If you're, and it may matter, you know, I mean, depending on whether you're coming from the West or the East, if you're, if you're out West, I know for my family, I think, you know, we live on a budget. We don't have unlimited uh, time and, and funds to get to the parks. So coming from the East, I know it's going to involve a plane flights out for, for four. And, uh, and so that's an investment, a rental car and so on. And I want to show a lot to them. So we've, we've generally gone to at least several of the parks when we come out. If you're out west and you're able to, uh, to do this by car and you, you have a little bit more time and latitude, you can get to more places, you might actually you know, have the luxury of saying, okay, let's, let's just go to one park and really explore it in detail. Or that may be your family style. You may say, you know, I want to get into the backcountry. I don't, I don't want to just see the things that you can see parking and doing day hikes from the road. I really want to like, let's, let's get some, you know, some tents and some sleeping bags and, and really take an extended hike into the parks. So you can do it either way and have fun. But I will say if particularly if a lot of the parks are going to be new for you or your families, there are some wonderful trips that get you to several of the parks that just feel like a natural to me. There's so much variety, so much beauty that uh, that I would say, you know, um, you can just make a dynamite trip when you string several of them together. Like I mentioned earlier, Yellowstone and the Tetons, they're side by side. Um, the Grand Teton National Park is just south of Yellowstone National Park. It's an easy drive. There are some people who just go to Yellowstone and never even recognize or think about the fact that, you know, the Tetons are so close. You feel like you're in a completely different world. Uh, Yellowstone's a high volcanic plateau. And so low rolling, rolling mountains surrounded by high mountains, but you're at fairly high elevation in the interior, all these volcanic features and all this wildlife. You go south to Jackson Hole, which is a valley with the Tetons, these, this mountain range rising above it. And uh, all of a sudden it feels like you're in another world. Maybe it's Switzerland, you know, something like that, because the, the peaks are so, so tall, glaciated, bare rock. And so it's, it's, uh, you really get some, you know, a place that has a completely different character, these beautiful, beautiful lakes sitting right under these big peaks. So those are fun to do together. I love going, you know, taking the, the, the loop from the Grand Canyon to Bryce and Zion National Parks. They're all really close to each other. The north rim of the Grand Canyon is an easy drive to both. The south rim isn't that much further. And they're all together. So you can, for instance, fly into Las Vegas, fly into Flagstaff, fly into Phoenix, get a car, and see all these parks in a week or thereabouts. Spend several days in each one, and each is going to be tremendously different. Together, the three parks are extraordinarily different. They're all part of the same geographic province, the Colorado Plateau, but, but have a completely different character to them. And none of them are like any place else on Earth. So um, those three are great to do together. But the same is true. You could go to Death Valley, Sequoia, Kings Canyon, and Yosemite. They're all fairly close to one another. They're all quite beautiful parks. In the Pacific Northwest, I was just up in Olympic National Park, but we flew over Mount Rainier, which is, which is just a few hours' drive away, the other side of Seattle. And from there, you can get to North Cascades, or you could drive down uh, the Oregon coast, and you could be at Crater Lake. Or at, at Mount St. Helens, which is a national monument, but an extraordinary place that I've spent a lot of time uh, doing field work when I was a, was a geologist. These parks are all close to one another, and collectively they make for uh, you know, a, really, a really wonderful exploration. So I'd say, I'd say if you're going to the parks, if you're going to make a, a big hike, like you know, plan a one-week or two-week trip to the parks, think about working in several of them. And don't miss the national monuments and state parks along the way, too. I think the hard part, you know, when you are trying to fit in a few, you know, I, I just had this at Yellowstone, it's such a big park. And then you're kind of confronted with, well, what, what am I going to do? And how can I fit in, you know, maybe the real highlights, especially if you're not familiar with, you know, what are the best hikes for families and outside, you know, some people, the only thing they associate with Yellowstone is Old Faithful, you know, and then there's so many other things to see. So how when people are going about planning their trip, do you have any recommendations for them? I mean, obviously, the books are a good start, but do you have any other tips on, you know, how you go about planning that your time knowing that it is usually fairly limited in a park? Absolutely. Um, it's well, the book, the books are, uh, you know, are certainly a great, a great start. We've tried to sort of distill a lot of the highlights, a lot of the most interesting features and accessible features and, uh, you know, best hikes and so on into the, uh, into the books. So definitely, if you get a chance, take a look at those. We have an app for uh, smartphones that also has a lot of information about the parks where people can vote on their favorite activities. And that's a good thing. 
TripAdvisor, of course, you know, has so much wonderful information about things to do when you go to a place. And I find it's a, it's a great resource because so many people are using it. And, you know, and they'll tell you what they thought of different hikes, of different other sorts of activities you can participate in. So I, I always love to look there. I also think talking to the rangers is is a hard thing to beat. No matter no matter how much research I've done before I get into a park, I love to stop at the visitor centers when I first arrive. See them often there are things like, you know, uh, dioramas and and 3D models of the park so that you can get this sort of aerial overview of uh, where you are and what you're going to see and their displays and then the rangers themselves often know just absolutely great things to do that uh, that nobody else would think of. They have their own personal favorites and they have loads of experience. One other thing I would recommend, of course, the, you know, I work in the group at National Geographic that offers trips and if you'd love to come to you know with us you're always welcome to but look at our itineraries because we've worked really hard to choose you know some great things to do and if you see things highlighted there whether you come with us or just go on on your own they're usually going to be pretty terrific things to do while you're in a national park those are all great tips really helpful because I think that's our problem too is just the overwhelming there's so much to do it's tailoring it down but when we went to Yellowstone I think we had very limited time but we stopped at the visitor center and talked to one of the rangers and it was it was helpful they pointed us into you know what we should do with what limited time we had so that was great yeah one other one other thing I'll recommend is Look on, I'd say, look on photo sites. Look, I mean, I'm thinking, you know, things like, again, you know, the trip advisors and so on will have this. If you just Google uh, information on the parks, you'll see lots of images and you can sort of page through them. Or if you're on Instagram, you can look for hashtags. And and often, you know, what I'll find now is uh, now that that's just such an accessible resource, I'll see places and think, I have to get there. I have to get there. I want to see that. I want to climb that. I want to paddle a boat on that on that lake. And so, you know, visually, you can kind of have an idea of what you're going to get when you get there. And then I'll, I'll often ask around, like, I'll see a place and say, that looks cool. I'll try and figure out where it is and then find out how I can get there. And I'll plan my trip around uh, around that. Yeah, I think that's great. I do that also on Instagram and even like Pinterest, too. But you yeah. can see like where people have taken these amazing photos. And then you think, OK, well, I want that photo. And how do, how do I yeah. get there? Yeah, so, of I course. Agree. Any other final tips for families about visiting national parks? I would say, um, you know, uh, first go. I mean, really, 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 uh, you know, if I, I know there are lots of families that, that kind of fall into the routine of going to the same place every year. You know, my, yeah. I, grew up, I grew up going to the beach. I live in, in Metro Washington, D.C., right, Northern Virginia. We would go to Ocean City, Maryland. We would do that every summer, and it's great. You know, that was sort of like a homecoming, a thing to look forward to. But I urge you not to make every vacation to the same place. You know, take some time out to go do something different and explore some of these treasures. I, I mean, I cannot tell you how fortunate we are to have the national parks we do in our country. I've uh, over nearly 25 years with the geographic. I've, I've had the privilege of traveling so many places around the world. Uh, many of them I never thought I'd get to. And, and I found lots of places that I love. There is no place on earth I love more than many of America's national parks. So they're right here for us. They're very inexpensive travel destination to get to. If you know, if you can get past the air ticket or make time to drive, then uh, you know, usually uh, places to stay near them are, are often much less expensive. Some of the best places to stay than in a lot of other places. Um, or you can camp, or you can do other things to make it affordable. So first go, you know, make a national parks trip. Two, don't overlook the places that are nearby, you know, national parks, state parks, national monuments, all the other parts of the park service, national seashores and lake shores, shores the uh, Assateague National Island, which is this wonderful stretch of wild beach is just south of uh, Ocean City, Maryland, where I always went. And, uh, and so now I'll take my kids over there. We see wild ponies roaming, uh, roaming by the shore. We see, uh, you know, all sorts of uh, incredible dunes and, and the beach itself is just wonderful. And so that's a, that's a really great treasure. So don't miss the ones that are near home. Three, I'd say, I'd say have the right gear, you know, comfortable shoes, you know, pack for the time of year. I, I, I was lucky to be able to take my family to Yellowstone in the winter last year. And, uh, you know, it got down to 20 below at night some nights. And even during the day, some of the days were bitter cold, but incredibly beautiful. Thick snow everywhere on the park. Um, the wildlife right out, very visible on the snow. We saw lots of lots and lots and lots of creatures. And all the hot springs and other hydrothermal features were so brilliant, you know, steaming in the uh, in the cold weather. And we, we just dressed right. We got some advice on how to layer, thermal underwear, good jackets, all of that. And uh, we were, all of us were really comfortable throughout that trip. So bringing the right gear 
Uh, if you're going to hike, bring lots of water. Um, and I love little hydration day packs like the Camelbacks and Ospreys and things like that. They're so much better to carry than a big book bag. A lot of parents will have their kids grab the book bag they take, bag they take to school or backpack. But the, these little day packs that are made just for taking a nice hike are just the right size to put a map or two in, some, you know, some snacks. Uh, you, can, you can carry lots and lots of water, and it's much better than carrying bottles in terms of being comfortable. And the more comfortable you are, the further you're going to want to go and the better you're going to enjoy your time. So, uh, so I'd say having the right gear is a great thing. Get good maps. Let the kids help plan and, uh, and go. Well, that kind of leads into our, our, one of our final questions, which is something we always ask. But we always ask our guests what they wear when they travel. So you've given us a little bit on uh, some shoes and some day packs. But do you have any specifics, things that you would really – kind of your go-to things for visiting oh. the parks? Absolutely. Sure. Um, you know, it's, you can, you can wear whatever you've got, you know, your jeans and t-shirts and, and all of that. I'll tell you when I, when I go, um, I'm, I'm a real fan of, uh, you know, they're, they're quick drying shorts. Some people will get the shorts with the long pants and you can zip off the legs and that's very practical. I'm more about, usually I try to figure out whether I want shorts or khakis and, and I'll pick whatever's, uh, pretty much going to be right for the day. But the quick drying ones are great so that if you end up taking an impromptu swim or, or if there's a short rainstorm, um, they're drying comfortable again really quickly. Um, and I've got several pair from Patagonia uh, that I that I really like. Shoes I like to wear. I've never been a fan, even though I've done a lot of hiking, I've never been a fan of big, heavy hiking boots. You know, it's great to have the ankle support and so on, but I just don't enjoy wearing them. And I used to wear running shoes all the time. But lately, I guess there's a whole new category of shoe that's made its way from the climbing community out to the public called approach shoes. And I just love them. They're perfect. They're um, uh, the right combination of you know, protection for your feet and comfort. And they just, they just sort of feel and look great. And they work really, really well on a lot of trails. So I'm wearing uh, these days a pair of uh, Scarpa Zodiacs that I picked up while I was in Iceland this summer. And they're, my, they're actually kind of my favorite hiking shoe ever. And they have them in a lot of, a lot of colors. Um, La Sportiva makes some too. And, and a lot of companies make them. It's good to have water shoes if you're going to do something like raft or kayak. Uh, or just be, you know, climbing in, uh, you know, walking in rivers, and so so things like I guess Keen makes uh, makes a pair that I've had for uh, for years, and I've had Tevis over the years as well, and and they're all good. A nice a nice field shirt. I usually wear a long sleeve shirt that I can roll up the sleeves on or roll them down if I get cold. You know, Columbia, Patagonia, things like that. A nice a nice really lightweight rain jacket for summertime that you can put in a backpack is good. I got one at LL Bean. It's funny. It's one of those categories of gear. That suddenly it was always pretty simple, but it's suddenly gotten very expensive. You can buy these beautiful jackets from companies such as Arcteryx for like five hundred dollars, and it's just a, a light plastic, you know, rain jacket. It's beautiful. It has a lot of features, and I love that brand uh, when I can afford it, which is occasionally, but pretty rarely. Um, but uh, but I, did, well, I was I was hunting for one, and I found one that LL Bean made, lightweight. I think it was less than fifty bucks. Might have been fifty bucks, and it's just perfect. It breathes. It's great. I can throw it in a backpack, and it doesn't take much space. And now I take it with me everywhere uh, when it's uh, when it's warm out. Um, and then for that winter trip to Yellowstone, uh, we ended up making a trip to REI and kind of found everything we wanted there. Uh, some, you know, uh, again, uh, sort of merino wool underwear and uh, winter jackets, uh, and, you know, pretty much go to Patagonia for us. But there are, there are a lot of brands that are great. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, but that's the, you know, that's, that's one where I've been able to find good gear at a really reasonable price and been pleased with it. That's awesome. Those, those shoes sound interesting. Definitely have to uh, check those out and we'll link to them in our show notes. Excellent. Thanks for being here today. And I understand that we're going to do a book giveaway for our listeners of some of the books that we talked about and, and some for kids. So can you tell us a little bit about what, what we're giving away? Absolutely. Uh, we're giving away a whole, a whole set of our books for kids about the national parks, uh, which includes our, our Kids Guide to the Parks, which is, uh, we talked about that earlier, an incredible resource, really wonderful resource, describes all 59 of the big national parks. Um, a book for younger kids, uh, Buddy Bison's Yellowstone Adventure, which is just a fun way to introduce young kids to that park and to uh, what is now America's national mammal, the, uh, the bison, newly named. Uh, the Junior Ranger Activity Book that you and your kids use when you went out west. Our funny fill-in book for uh, driving in the car, which again is like uh, sort of like a Mad Libs book on the national parks. And then finally, as a reference for 
the parents who win this prize for their kids, we're giving away with that bundle our uh, adult parks guide, the, the guide to the national parks, the new edition we created, the eighth edition for the centennial of the U.S. National Park Service. That's great. I will say that we've some of our listeners have been asking for an episode on national parks and Grand Canyon, and I know some of them have some uh, trips planned coming up very soon, so I'm sure that they're going to be very happy to try to enter and win that prize. I think I want to try and enter to win the prize, but I'm pretty sure that's not allowed. <laughs> so we will give you all the details. Stay tuned for all the details about how to enter to win. Thanks so much, Ford, for your time. We really appreciate it. You have such enthusiasm. And I, every time I speak to someone, I always want to go plan a trip to that place. But now I want to go plan a trip to, you know, at least... 57 national parks. No, I'm just kidding. There you go. Yeah, that's right. You got to finish, finish, finish your list. Keep, uh, yeah. keep it going. <laughs> the, uh, well, always a pleasure to, uh, to speak to you both. Thank you so much for having me on your show, on your podcast and delighted that you're as excited about the national parks as I am. And all of us at national geographic are great. And if people want to follow your travels, are you on Instagram or anything like that, that they can follow I- along? I am. I'm on Instagram. I'm I'm Ford Cochran. Uh, no space. No no period. F O R D C O C H R A N on Instagram and on Facebook as well. And they can uh, they can follow my travels and adventures there. Well, thank you so much. Thank you too. Take care. Bye. All right. So we already covered our app of the week, which was National Geographic's National Parks app. And while we're talking about national parks, we would love to hear what your favorites are. So if you want to send us an email to podcast at vacationmavens.com or leave us a message on our Facebook page or in iTunes, you know, wherever you want to reach out to us, let us know what your favorite national park is and we'll give you a shout out. Great. I'll take a minute just to tell everyone that we hope you join us next week because we're going to be diving even deeper and we are going to be talking about the Grand Canyon, which is a popular destination for a lot of families. And we have some good tips on just things to do and um, how to plan a trip there. So definitely join us for that. And if you're headed to Yellowstone or thinking about Yellowstone, you can always go back and listen to episode number nine, which was all about national parks and Yellowstone specifically. So thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week.